And now we have uh, Rado Kotorov from Information Builders. Very welcome to stage. You, you guessed correctly. Huh? <laughs> you guessed correctly. Both my name and the company I'm with. Oh. <laughs> okay. AI, eh? Huh? Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. And um, I, I want to preface this presentation with um, why we did it and why we decided to do that. And a lot of times when I go, I'm asked, why do we do these things? Why do we do these things with technology? Why do we do these things with data? Why, what is the impact? And, and knowing this helps us, putting it into a perspective, make also the right strategic decision. So I'll kind of start with the macro fac factors behind all the data collection, and I'll get you how they are changing the way we do things and why they're pushing these macro factors are pushing us more towards operational decision support. So we talk a lot about, um, we talk a lot about uh, the industrial, the fourth industrial revolution, and we started doing research around that and looked at all the revolutions. And what's interesting, what we found is that there are actually more data revolution than are driving what's happening than anything else. And I'll give you just a few examples. Uh, the invention of writing was the first big step into large-scale data collection. And it allowed the Egyptians to build very concrete business records, sales records, uh, tax records, and etc. And because of that, then they started, were able to do large-scale projects for uh, whether this was water supply or pyramids or anything. And it gave rise to the cities. And, um, and trade expansion in general. So very important part of it, this business growth and uh, tremendous change in civilization was driven because of our abilities to collect business data. The next one that happened, and if you look through history, there are a lot of them, was the invention of double entry accounting. And it was the first manual ERP system. It, would, uh, it allowed the Italians, the Genoa merchants to actually manage very well their agents around the world. So they expand it in a tremendous way. And the reason I chose this example about the double entry accounting, because it's still, a techno it's still something that we do and we keep enhancing and we're trying to collect the leverage it to collect more and more data. So with the invention of the computer, we built the ERP systems that, you know, the financial systems that added more data to what we were collecting in accounting. And most interestingly today, when you look at blockchain, essentially as a technology, blockchain is the universal accounting ledger. And the reason we're doing it is economically very simple. There is actually a Nobel Prize given exactly for this case uh, to Ronald Coase for transaction cost economics. The reason we're doing this is to lower the transaction cost. So the more data we collect, the better insight we have on the business, but the more accessible the data is from all of us, the faster and the more secure the transactions are. And so that's kind of the way of thinking that we're interested in is, how do we leverage the data in this strategic asset? And that's why I'm bringing the historical examples because we need to put in context how we manage the data and how we make money with it. And probably the more relevant today example is of what's happening is the, with putting sensors in all processes and, uh, to monitor, uh, and to monitor processes, activities, and status of various events and etc. And if you have to compare this big transition and the, the, the impact of this, it is actually equivalent to the invention of the microscope. And the microscope allowed us to look in a very detailed singular cases and use them to find knowledge and to cure diseases and etc. And now we can put under the microscope entire factories, entire cities. I mean, actually somebody was telling me about monitoring here the transportation in Sweden, getting every car. Somebody just showed me that all the trees being scanned in Sweden. So we're putting everything that we have under this tremendous microscope and we're still not know how exactly would we monetize that. So we are ahead of time in terms of data collection, but behind in terms of monetizing all of these things. So why is this important from an economic and um, business perspective? And I'll give you here a couple of examples and talk about the changing nature of the competition. 
This is a very well-known case. The so-called assetless or, or data companies are becoming more valuable and growing faster than actually the companies that have assets. Airbnb doesn't, have, doesn't own a single property and is more valuable than the combined value of Marriott and Hilton. And that's amazing. And that practically speaks in the change of thinking and in treating what they do, treating data really as an asset which you can monetize. And it's an important shift because if you ask a company, would you actually divest of all your assets to become a data company and change your business model, people would resist it and say, no, I'm not going to do that. But, and you don't have to do it. But essentially, companies should think as if they don't own assets, physical assets, and they own only data. And that change of thinking is actually the most important and the most difficult transition. And I'll give you one example of a very large company that realized that and changed completely. This is General Electric. They realized that suddenly their cycles of selling machines became longer and longer. And when they started looking into it, they realized that there were tiny software companies that hooked to their machines, started leveraging data to extend the life cycle of the machines. So the CEO immediately realized that the margins have moved from the manufacturer to the data owner. And what did he do? He said, we need to become a software company. And GE transitioned themselves to a manufacturer, but in terms of thinking and in terms of what they do, they're right now the number ninth largest software company. And that's kind of a difficult mental transition, but an important one. So how does the data and these things, what I showed on the previous slide, affect the competition? And that, again, requires a tremendous shift. First of all, the first mover advantage matters tremendously. And because it can scale very quickly. And uh, Uber is one of the companies that scaled, so this data kind of driven competition has two aspects, scale and scope. And companies lose very quickly on both. So if we look traditionally and historically, companies that relied on assets, it took them 20 years to reach to 1 billion valuation. 20 years. Uber did it in four years. And again, they don't own assets. That's the paradox about it. So this kind of scaling very quickly when you are an assetless company has a tremendous impact on your business. If you think as a physical world manager, that's not so scary because if you were a car manufacturer and you need to build assembly line and somebody enters the marketplace, you still had time to build factories and still would take somebody a lot more time to build factories in order to, uh, to catch up with your output. But that's, even, that's changing even in there. With Uber, you don't need to build factories. With Airbnb, you don't need to build hotels. So it has a dramatic shift in how quickly they scale. The second one, which we don't see often and completely ignore, is the, the scope expansion. Amazon started as a bookstore retailer, applied the same knowledge of data management to every other aspect of retail, and also to managing the IT services. And that's, a tr that's an incredible expansion of scope that companies actually missed. And I didn't realize how quickly you can optimize adjacent markets just by the knowledge you have acquired about how to treat data as an asset. And the most interesting stuff about Amazon is actually that now the two industries that are absolutely scared of them after their entry into the supermarkets are the logistic industry, FedEx, <coughs> UPS, TNT. They're terrified that Amazon can manage and optimize logistics better than them. And the other most interesting industry affected is the insurance industry, the health insurance industry. They're expecting that Amazon is going to get into this business within the next year or two. And this all comes, how can somebody who has never had a subject matter expertise in insurance or logistics or something get into a market and capture market share so quickly? And this is because of the scope effects of managing data. So we often advise that when you kind of look at the competition, that you have to figure out where is the first mover advantage going to be come from and where is the scope expansion going to come and how you can adjust your operations to actually uh, avoid this hyper competition. And if you think that, you know, this is not true, he actually called his book that just came out, Bezos called it first mover. He has relied very heavily on that. This has been his philosophy through life. 
uh, and, and he has applied it very methodically and, and continues to apply. Um, so with this, I want to move to the more pragmatic area about, yes, we know what the data is, we want to monetize it, we, we can understand the competition. Uh, and what is the biggest impact going to happen and what's the thing that we see is happening? And, and kind of the, the biggest change in uh, BI and analytics is the shift from analysis to actually decision making, to supporting the decision making in the organization. It's a new focus, we all demand faster decisions, and we need new tools about how we're going to do these faster decisions. And again, part of it is that analysis can be slow. And if you're living in the world of hyper-competition, naturally you want to facilitate uh, through decision-making the areas where you can capture the biggest benefits. So here is what's going on. We've been doing the BI in the last seven years with concepts about self-service, empowering the knowledge workers, and etc. But the vote is still out on self-service. And what actually has happened is that the self-service has failed to deliver. We still have a penetration of BI and information of about 30%. So 70% of employees in the organizations do not get information and do not make fact-based decisions, which means that your decision-making process in the enterprise is not standardized and is based on gut feeling, and the gut is a terrible uh, decision-maker. So because of this fact, because after seven years, seven years when the ago when the self-service supposedly revolution started, the BI penetration was about 25%. So with all the investments we've done, we haven't increased it dramatically, zero change practically. So, and we have more analysis than we ever had, but we don't get an ROI and we don't operationalize it. So we're trying to move, how do you operationalize it? How do you support these frontline people? The other thing that we failed as an industry to do is to make a distinction between analysis and decision making. And it's a topic that only the behavioral economists kind of tackle today, but it's the most important because those 70% are decision makers, they're not analysts. And the 30%, some of them are analysts, some of them support the executive management, but they require very different things, and I'll give you examples. So, Analysis is about what happened, why it happened, root causes, and all of these things. It's about knowing data and combining data and things and methods of analysis. And it's very time consuming. There is, if once you're given an Excel sheet, you're going to spend at least 30 minutes in it, whether you're going to do something with it or not, just going through the rows. It's the nature of analytical activity. The decision making, on the other hand, is about when and how. When do I need to decide? what I need to do, how I need to do it, right there. And you need clear choices because most of these 70% are on the frontline operations that need to make decisions on the job and very quickly. And because we haven't clearly delineated analysis versus decision making, we haven't focused really uh, in the past about how do you deliver information for decision making versus for analysis. And if you want to see more about why you need clear choices and uh, why it's important to deliver information, it's a fascinating book uh, by a Nobel Prize winner, uh, by, about a Nobel Prize winner and how they analyze the decision-making process across industries and their recommendations about how we can improve that. So I'm going to give you here two examples of the shift to decision-making and the different tools versus the... Uh, versus the analysis. And again, I keep emphasizing the dimensions. Those operational people, they need to make decisions very quickly. And that's why one of the best tools I have here to illustrate is Expedia. And uh, Expedia is your book tickets, and many people say it's a booking company, but it actually is the largest report generator and information retrieval tool for travel planning. Believe it or not, the, the name Expedia means querying data at X speed. And it accesses thousands of data sources, and it presents you all kind of information from prices to predictions about prices and et cetera, and it doesn't require any training. So anybody can go and right there from the beginning, they can start using the site without requiring to read any manual or learn any kind of workflows like you would do if you are in Excel, Power BI, any of the tools that are there. 
And the trick, which is difficult, and um, we don't take, like I said, into account, is they calculated that on average it takes the person six minutes to book a flight or make a decision. If the time goes above six minutes, people are going to call a travel agent. So if you're going to make an operational application, if we're going to move in a world when we want people to make fact-based decisions very quickly, we really need to understand the time constraint and how the individual decision maker would react if, we, if they don't make a decision within this time constraint. Uh, and we never, when we design things, when I ask people about the timing, how much time do you think your people spend on reporting or reading information or getting it? We, we actually avoid this question in the industry. Part of it is because most people complain about how long it is. But it's the number one question that we should measure when we are delivering information, especially in this fast-paced world. And I go back to my favorite example about Amazon and stuff. But I'll get you three, 35 years back in uh, Walmart, when Walmart was building the first reports with PNG about what they do. And Sam Walton asked the guys from Procter & Gamble to give him statistics on, on diapers. And I had every package, how many they shipped, to which area, to whatever happened. And I said, I have one and only one question, and you haven't answered it. What's that question? Anyone wants to guess? The question was, did we make money? That's the only question that every CEO has in their mind. Did we make money? The guy said, oh, it's a lot of data. We have to go and study it, and we'll come back. And they came back after six months with a report and said, you lost money. And he called his managers and said, if I learn a year later that I lost money on a product, we're going to go out of business. I need it every evening. And that gave the race to retailing their famous system that linked all the suppliers and everybody else. And the retail link, actually, he was having the information every day about every product and every SKU level about their profitability on it. And that's 30 years ago. And if you take this, Amazon has taken this a notch up by a lot. And that's what I want you to take one key takeaway from here, is that it matters to get the information really there in the right time to make decisions. The other application I'll give you is, and that again goes back to behavior, is a fort and how analytics and, um, and decision making differ. They had a problem years ago about their maintenance costs. So they hired analysts to analyze, figure out what's going on. The analysts went back with great scatter plots. And we all love fancy charts. Believe it or not, operational workers don't. They hate them because they have to think. You have to analyze a scatter plot. So they went back and said, some of your dealerships are replacing rather than repairing parts. And that's hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's two millions over the year. And um, they said, what can we do? And of course, one thing is to send to the dealerships a report with the scatter plot and said, don't repair, don't replace, repair. Do you think they would do that? No. Why? Because you have human behavior. The mechanic is incented to move cars as quickly as possible out of the dealership. So when it comes to his gut feeling, the mechanic takes the path of least resistance. I'm going to take 20 minutes to investigate this part versus 20 minutes to replace it. Of course I'm going to replace it. And there is no way you can change it. So what they realized is that if you want to change behavior, you have to do it in a systematic way. You have to give the mechanic an application that tells them here is the part and this part has now a probability of 70% of being re repaired. And now the mechanic can make a decision. And his manager cannot blame the mechanic if that's the wrong decision for this particular case. So again, they need to do it right there very quickly and get the right information. And the one thing we did with this application, which was quite interesting, it was given to different departments to design it, to accounting, to marketing, to all kinds of other departments. The accountants made the application look like Excel. The marketers put a 3D car with heat maps on it, color coded it past. And so whenever I ask people, which one do you think they chose? Everybody says, oh, the 3D car is great. No, the mechanics chose this because they said, the car is here right in front of me. I don't want to be three clicks away from making a decision. So speed comes uh, tremendously important in the way we deliver information. And with this, I'm going to say one last word and finish it. So when you think about where we are in terms of analytics, we do these things well. 
we capture data, we enrich it, we manipulate it, we do analysis of it. But we fairly make a transition from analysis, from the scatter plot that showed the costs, to actually going and building a decision support type of applications or customer facing applications where all the monetization occurs. So we really wanted to show is that we do this part, but this is just turning data into an asset. But if we want to monetize it, we need to take it to the next step and, and really put it in an operational process where the money are making with measurable impact on what we achieve. And uh, with this, I don't know if we have time for questions. My time is up. Do I run? Or <laughs> uh, let's see. Thank you very much. Thank you.